I always start off my talks with sort of an interesting story, and I always try, how am I going to engage people right from the start? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll will do it. Um, but I usually am inspired by something in the environment, because I study the world around us, and I use the virtual world to do that. Well, I was sitting shaving this morning, which is always a dangerous task when you're 48 or older, and one of my daughters comes up to me with a philosophical question. She goes, I was listening to the radio the other day, and she said, Humpty Dumpty, was his mother a chicken? <laughs> or a human? Or a human-chicken hybrid? 6.30 in the morning, I'm asked this question, right? I started, I looked at her and I started, and then I was thinking, was this mother a chicken? Yeah, it's, it's crazy, right? You're going right. You're all, it's a philosophical question. So, not, it's going to change the world, it might. So, then I look at her and I say, you realize I'm a behavioral scientist? She goes, yeah, but you know everything. I'm a dad, I must know everything, right? Yeah. I did the important thing. I said, your mom's a biologist. <laughs> Go wake her up. <laughs> so I decided to. So that was sort of my lead in. But I'm going to talk about what I do. And this pretty much sums up 20 years of my life. In college, I'm not going to say like other people, I became interested in drugs. No, not funny. Actually, researching drugs. Now, that sounds even worse, right? No, became interested in studying why people use drugs, why people gain weight, why people can't keep weight off. So these are the five things that I sort of have studied over the years, and they're all related. And I'll first start off with a little bit of a story about the first one, cocaine. Um, when I was getting my PhD, I was studying why people use cocaine. And I became very interested in this world called craving, how people somehow say, I'm craving a drug so bad that I'm willing to give up everything in my life to do it. I was like entranced by this. This is amazing how people can do this. I know the drugs are powerful, but they were describing. So I'll never forget a guy came in and sat down and, and said, I'm interviewing them at this study. He said, you know what, Dr. Bordnick? First off, I said, that's somebody older. Call me Patrick, because that was 20 years ago. And I said, he said, I don't know why I'm using. He said, I've been clean for 10 years. And I said, well, can you tell me a little bit about what happened? He said, well, I was clean for about 10 years. I hadn't smoked a rock in that long. And he said, one day at the office... My boss was really mean to me and just kind of really gave me a hard time. He said, I left the office that day feeling very anxious. And he said, next thing you know, I'm driving by the neighborhood where I used to use. And I was like, okay, so describe what happened. And he said, I started getting butterflies in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, whoa, okay, let's think about this. He said, well, that, what happened next? He said, I'm sitting in front of you today, two to three years later. He said, next thing you know, I was smoking. I'm smoking five rocks a day. And he said, I can't stop. Everything sort of reminds me of cocaine. So that, again, as a scientist, I became very interested in what's going on here. There's something that's triggering this behavior, and, and how can we study this to actually improve treatment and help this person who had been clean for 10 years? The next thing, cocktails, I started hearing the same thing with alcohol-dependent people. They kept saying the same thing. Cigarettes, too, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Cupcakes, cupcakes are there. Who doesn't like cupcakes, right? Condoms, they're going, condoms, cupcakes, this is getting really weird. <laughs> It gets weirder, trust me. So condoms, again, thinking about behavior. Unprotected sex can lead to HIV, STDs, unwanted pregnancy. When you're taking drugs or alcohol, it puts you at a higher risk profile. So this all became part of my research. And the idea of change. This is how we associate change in our society. Epic fail. How many people out there have tried to change something in their lives? About three, no. Everybody in here has tried it. Right? But the first thing, we want, to be, we want to change, but the big problem is we have a hard time. And the first figure is 80% of people have to try to lose weight have actually gained weight or actually gained more weight back than they've actually lost. So 80% fail at losing weight. 60% is drugs or alcohol. So against these odds, something's really going on. Why aren't we able to change? So success is very small. I say, I come from a profession of social work, and we actually study people in their environment. It's a perspective we use, an ecological perspective. It's not just the internal states of the person, but it's everything around them, the social environment, how they interact, the places they live, the jobs they have. So knowing these enemies becomes the crux of how we can change. We can't just change. I can stop people from using cocaine by giving them a medication and blocking the drug. That's easy. 
getting someone to stop. But actually, long-term change is more difficult. Again, I borrow something from Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> when I think about this, remember when Luke was sitting there trying to use the Force and he kept getting frustrated and said, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And our little green friend said to him, you must unlearn what you have learned. Think about when we change our behavior. We must unlearn being a cocaine addict. That's who we become as a cocaine addict. Everything around us is, stu- is surrounded by that drug, right? So how do we change? What can we do? We must unlearn these things and learn a different relationship with ourselves and become a non-cocaine user. Smoking. This is one of my favorite examples, besides the really cool skull graphic. Think about someone that smokes. We, we have people that smoke, and we probably have smokers in the audience, and I won't have you raise your hand, but... We talk about smokers saying craving, and something reminds me of using all the time, right? Something triggers this behavior, and I really want a cigarette. Well, just think, if you're a half a pack a day smoker, in one week, you get 700 doses of nicotine. That's one cigarette, take about 10 puffs, half a pack of cigarette, and you multiply that out. Again, everything becomes associated with smoking in your life, right? So trying to change that behavior is difficult. When you walk into the office, we call it running the gauntlet if you're trying to stop smoking. You smoke right outside the office doors. So if you're a smoker and you're trying to stop, the minute you see the office or the entrance to the office, you get a craving to to smoke a cigarette. Very problematic. Sex. When you have sex, if you smoke after sex, your morning coffee, all of these things set you up for potential failure if we haven't dealt with them properly. That's just one example from smokers. Again, I got a good thing. Knowing your enemies. Again, this is my little street cred moment here. They're thinking, wow, he's in an ivory tower. He's an academic. What does he know about change? <laughs> I can't think of trying to bend that way. That's me when I weighed 233 pounds. I know. There's no applause. No applause. That's great. That's great. Was that wanting me to be that heavy again? I wasn't sure. It's was was like, you look better there. Um, but again... I know change because it's a personal story. I've had to change my relationship with food. I had to do what Yoda told me to do. I had to unlearn what I had learned. Everything was about food. I remember my go-to meal at McDonald's. It was a Big Mac, filet of fish large fry, not a Diet Coke. That's a, that's a new school thing. It was, a, it was an extra large regular Coke. That was my go-to meal. That's enough calories for one day. And that's what I ate. So I really had to change my feelings towards food, how I felt about myself and what I did in order to evoke change. And it was looking at all the things in my environment, not just eating. Losing, I, can, I calculated the other day that in my life I've lost about 185 pounds, gained some back and lost. I've been at my current weight, which is about 150. I'm not supposed to tell our weight in public, but I can do it. It's a TED Talk. Um, <laughs> for about 25 years now. Now, how have I done that? It's because I've changed my relationship with food and what I do. Very difficult. Even in the green room, it was filled with snacks back there. Did I eat something? Sure, I had a few things back there. But before, I would have had a lot of things. So I've changed that dynamic. So what I want to talk about is the virtual reality and what we do. Traditional therapy, and I'm a therapist, we come in, right? And we role play with our clients. If we want you to stop smoking marijuana... I sit there with a client and I say, okay, let's pretend I'm a person you use with and I'm going to offer you a joint. The problem with that is the context is wrong and it always bothered me. I'm a really good therapist, but I'm not that great that I can actually recreate the drug context for you. We should be able to go into the environment where you smoke marijuana and teach you skills not to use or a crack house or something like that. That's really where we need to put you so when you're out in those environments, you can remember the, the things we've taught you to change to do that. It just bothered me. Traditional therapy, the context was off. Where we were teaching people skills was incongruent with use. So I decided to take traditional therapies that we do and merge them with technology. Dun, da, da, da. Oh, I just been ponged. Sorry about that. No. This actually gets into my thing. Does anyone remember Pong? Everybody loves Pong. How can you not like Pong, right? And now they're applauding Pong. Excellent. <laughs> Dr. Bordnick, you were good, but Pong. <laughs> right? So, again, when we think about 
the video game, this was the first video game I ever owned. It was on an Intellivision. This was 1970-ish. I know I probably only look 35, yeah, right? Um, but again, this is it. This is what started my idea of how do we use video games, going back to what I did as a kid. So what we do, let me grab a headset over here. Virtual reality, how we use it, it takes a computer-human interaction, a reciprocal relationship that goes beyond a video game, right? You see the person in the picture there in the graphic. We're taking them and putting them in a virtual reality headset like this. This, pr this provides visuals, audio, and has a head tracker. So if I wanted to recreate this environment here, I would actually create this whole digital world, filling this room with avatars, and practice my TED Talk in front of you. And as I looked around, I'd see my slides, I'd see the TEDx logo. We'd recreate this world. So we would immerse you in this particular world. And then we can bring the real world into the clinical space where we can teach skills. Then it says, well, how real is real, right? This is back in 1980s. You guys remember the graphics Pac-Man? Right now, these are drinks, virtual drinks in our lab. Even down to the top, that if you have someone who's alcohol dependent in there, the scotch and whiskey has that oily sheen on top when you get right over it. The ice reflects things. Why is that important? Because we need to recreate the real world in the clinical space so we can teach skills. Because if these drinks don't really engender a real world reaction, then how am I gonna teach somebody a coping skill to not use in this space? This is one of our virtual parties that I'm really proud of. Our avatars are all HD. They look like you and I. They're not a cartoon character offering you a joint or a stick figure. They're real people. If you were to go around this avatar, she has barrettes in the back of her hair. There's that level of detail, which is very important. Reality, we look at old factories. So I have a scent machine that was developed in my lab. So it's USB controlled. I know that's kind of kitschy. But we can have people pick up virtual drinks, virtual cigarettes. They get a full sensory experience. And the more we provide this, we can create that real world in the clinical space to teach coping skills not to use. Wow, limes, that's pretty cool. I'm thinking of margaritas. Um, <laughs> you know you are. But again, think about this. Putting that up there, some of your mouths are starting to pucker right now looking at that. Real quick story in our lab, we had lemons, lemon and limes on a cutting board in a virtual kitchen that we had, and we had beer and we had pizza. The two scents in the environment were beer and pizza scent. After we ran a bunch of people through the environment, 80% of them said they loved the smell of limes. There was no lime scent in there. There was lemon limes there, but people will fill in part of the equation. So that's how we gain that realism. Yeah, but all right. I'm not looking down. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> a little bit more. All right. Perfect. Stop right there. Yeah. Now, if you can face my voice. <laughs> so your next task is while you're looking down, you're going to take one big step forward. No. <laughs> Go ahead and feel, feel out the edge. Feel the edge with your feet. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Perfect. Okay. That gives you an idea of how real the virtual space is. You saw the guy's jaw clenching. He's shaking. Two minutes before he didn't have the Oculus Rift headset on, he knows he's a half inch off the ground. There's no big cavern there. But when you're in virtual reality, it's as if you're actually there. He's feeling like, you saw the whole video, he's going like this. I thought you, some of you in the ground room was he's gonna jump on us or something. Not gonna do that. But again, that gives you an idea of how virtual reality has come along and what we've changed. It really immerses you in a different space. So we now have a therapeutic tool that we can bring into the clinical or laboratory space and teach people all kinds of skills, whether it's weight loss or stop using drugs. We're to that point now. We have all types of context and settings. Um, I've got one down in the bottom corner, which is a convenience store. I like to, because these environments sometimes can be expensive to create, I like to multi-use them. So the convenience store. Think about when you're standing at a gas pump and you look up and right now there's a cigarette ad right above the gas pump. We've got that in our virtual uh, worlds, teaching smokers not to use. They're going to be exposed to that. So how can we do that and teach them skills not to use? It's exactly what we do. We also use that if we're in Texas here, you know that right behind the counter, right, there's cash register, right behind there, there's a cooler full of beer and ice, right? If you're alcohol dependent and you go in there, 
you're going to be expo exposed to those types of triggers and you need to know how to deal with those situations. So we really try to recreate everything down to the worlds that you're going to experience. This is a typical clinical setup that we have. I have state-of-the-art things in my lab because we do all types of basic research as well as treatment research. But in a typical clinical space, you're wearing a head-mounted display like that. You have a clinician that's sitting there with two monitors, sort of a Wizard of Oz interface. But that clinician can see what that patient's seeing and can actually teach them skills in real time and can repeat the interactions over and over again. Currently, this is one of the projects I'm most proud of. We're studying heroin users, and we're trying to look at injection drug users and to get them to stop craving and to actually teach them skills to not use in the environment. We have the only heroin injecting avatar in the world. <laughs> I'm proud of it. Um, because how else would I expose heroin addicts to something if I didn't have a perfect thing. So we actually had someone come in, act out cooking heroin, injecting heroin, and that was motion captured, and that is put on this avatar. So when people go into the shooting galleries, what we call it, where people use heroin, they're going to see this realistic avatar shooting up heroin. Hey, come on in. I'm Marcia. What's your name? A new virtual reality cave at the University of Houston is the newest technology to help study human behavior. We wanted to try something different where we could present the virtual environments life-size to people in our studies. Using eight infrared cameras, this system can track a study participant's movement while they use special glasses to see the world in 3D. It adds another degree of realism um, to what we do. When they walk around, it's as if they're really walking around in the real world. Participants are placed in situations that may tempt them to use drugs or alcohol. And by creating the real-world scenarios, Professor Bordnick hopes he can teach the coping skills necessary to help stop a relapse. Our hope is in the future is when they go out into the real world that they'll remember this experience and they'll not use drugs and remember the skills we taught them. You like the video better than the live. <laughs> Depressing. But you know, how real is that virtual reality? That almost was like I was in the video wearing this exact same shirt. <laughs> it's incredible. Technology, I love it. I've got the future. The future, I hate to tell you, but I'm excited about it, is cardboard. You saw a lot of very expensive equipment. Some of the head-mounted displays in my lab are about forty to $50,000. That's not accessible to treatment clinics and to users out in the environment or people trying to overcome, maybe trying to uh, go to a virtual buffet to learn to refuse to eat and to change their relationship with food. This is the latest. You guys have, well, mine's decorated by my daughters for Day of the Dead. Um, but this is a cardboard virtual reality headset. You open it up. Let me see where my phone is. Don't want to drop my phone on stage. You actually put your cell phone into this viewer, like so. And you actually can get a completely immersive experience right here for a $15 piece of cardboard and the cell phone in here. And it actually has a head tracker because it uses the phone. So you actually can get a full experience. So now this is becoming accessible. This is our future in virtual reality. It's the future of treatment, and it's how we're going to evoke change. I didn't invent this. But I'm working on software that's going to bring our environments to people out there so we can help those in need. That's what I want to see. That's the true vision of a social worker and a visionary going forward using technology to help people. I want to end on this slide. I started off talking about change. I changed. I changed my relationship. We remember what Yoda taught us. Unlearn what you have, what you have learned. Let's think about change as not just, hey, I'm going to go on a diet on Monday, because that's what everybody does. It's Monday, and you feast today, right, and famine tomorrow. But let's think. It's not just being on a diet. It's changing your whole relationship and knowing those enemies to overcome them so you're successful, so you can make it possible for change. Thank you. <laughs>